All right, so um, you know, what we, you know, one of the things we've seen in Silicon Valley over the last couple of years, and actually, um, you know, it's been the last couple of years that I've been angel investing <clears throat> uh, after, after a liquidity event of my own as an entrepreneur, is massive liquidity on the, uh, on the angel side, on the early capital, you know, early capital into a company. And why don't we just go around, maybe start with you, Jeff, just give a, give a sense of that, the kind of liquidity that we're seeing in Silicon Valley and what that means for the entrepreneurs as well as what does it mean for us. I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of interesting trends. Maybe you can just kick that off. Sure. So uh, just as a reminder, I've uh, been investing for about 10 years. For six years, I've been focusing on um, uh, Web 2.0 consumer internet, uh, first as a business angel and then as a micro VC. And um, I've been investing in about 90 companies in six years. And traditionally, liquidity events were really backed at the end of the process where everyone was waiting for an IPO or a trade sale to start getting this liquidity. And for the founders and some of the early employees and early investors, it could mean waiting for five, seven, ten years. What we see now, thanks to companies like uh, Barry Second Market, is the opportunity to get liquid partially after two, three, five years. And that sort of changes the dynamic. A, it removes the pressure on the early employees to sort of make some money and continue working for, for their company. And for the early investors, you know, it's an opportunity to sort of rotate their capital a bit faster. Personally, I, I never sell early, so I just go all the way. But some other of my colleagues have a different strategy. Okay, well, I, so I, I agree. So there's a lot of us that stay in for the whole, for the whole thing mm -hmm. until the exit. But it seems like just the, the general liquidity not necessarily for angels selling into the next round, but generally, you know, we have hundreds of angels now in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. investing. Deals are happening much more quickly. Um, I mean, maybe on the second market side, there's some interesting, I mean, I think that's part of the overall trend. Um, I mean, what, what's, your, what's your take on that? So my, my name is uh, Philippe Botteri. I'm in, uh, an investor with uh, Bessemer Venture Partners. Oh, sorry, Philippe. I, sorry, go ahead, sorry. That's what happens when you arrive late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try to get a hold of it. Yeah. So we're, we're, a, we're a global fund, and I focus on software and internet investments. So first of all, let me start by, say, by saying uh, something as there's been a, a lot of uh, controversy in the past month about VCs and super angels. So I do love angels, and I do love super angels, and we are very grat grateful that um, you know, they're fun funding and seeding all these companies, and we're here to, uh, you know, to lead the, uh, the air round and be round. And so I think our role is uh, very complementary here. Um, no, it, it's, it's, so it, it's true that uh, we're seeing longer and longer time to exit, and therefore there is a, a need of liquidity, uh, potentially for the angels, but also for the, uh, for the entrepreneurs, who at some point when the company has been founded for, you know, six, seven years, it makes sense for them to take partial liquidity off. Of course, we would like, we like them to still have skin in the games, but if they want to sell 20% of their holdings, that's, uh, that's perfectly uh, fine. And uh, it's the same for the angels. So uh, it happens very often that as part of uh, a growth round of you know, 10, 15 million dollars, uh, you know, three, four of that will be to, uh, or five of that will be to buy out some of the angels or uh, you know, some of the, the founder share. Okay, well, let's just keep going. Go for it. <clears throat> uh, hi, everybody. Barry Silbert, founder, CEO of Second Market. So I think, I think it's important for us to talk about uh, for a second you know, what's happening with exits and why is this even, you know, this, this concept of liquidity before what was traditionally kind of the exit path, which is an IPO or M&A, why is it even happening? Um, I think it's fair to say that the public markets are broken and the IPO has been dying a slow death for the past 10 years and people haven't really realized it. Um, you know, if you look at the number of IPOs that have happened, historically speaking, um, you know, let's just look at the U.S. market. You know, it was 400, 500 IPOs per year. You know, we're now down to 100, 150 IPOs per year. And if you look at those IPOs, they are a very, very large companies, generally speaking. So Jeff mentioned kind of this time to exit. Uh, in the past, uh, it was on average, you would found your company and you would sell it or you take it public in four or five years on average. Today, it's over 10 years. A lot longer. So think about that for a second. It means when you hire an employee, you say to them, okay, we're going to pay you half of what you're worth in cash, but you've got to wait 10 years 
to get any value for that stock. Uh, or if you take in money from an angel investor or a venture capital firm, you know, they can't wait 10 years. So what's happened over the past, you know, let's call it two or three years, is there's become this huge need for liquidity from angels, from existing employees, from former employees. And um, the good news is that there's a lot of capital that's now coming to this market that's able to fulfill kind of that, that need. Now, having said that, I think it's interesting to see that there are now liquidity events uh, for entrepreneurs in as early as Series A rounds, which I don't know if that's healthy. But the good news is that as this money comes into this market, it's providing options. It's providing alternatives to all of us as entrepreneurs to essentially um, go big, to basically swing for the fences because there's no longer pressure to do that sale when that first bid comes along or to get pressure from your venture capital firm who needs to get liquidity back to their LPs um, and forces you to embark on, a, on an IPO path when it may not even be successful. So Barry, you said you didn't know whether it was healthy or not for an entrepreneur to get liquidity in, say, their, their round following the angel investment. Um, I mean, I, what's your take on that? Is it healthy or is it not? Uh, do you have an opinion on the, on the matter? I mean, you're certainly bringing that liquidity to the table. You're helping, you're helping entrepreneurs and angels get liquidity before the exit. You must hear from VCs every once in a while. What do they say to you? I think uh, aside from the, the Foursquare or the Quora type examples, actually I don't know if Quora got early liquidity, but I, I heard they did. Um, those are very unique situations. Um, I hope it's not a trend uh, for most entrepreneurs. I mean, we've been at this for five years, and you know, I'm still pretty damn hungry, and I haven't sold any stock. Uh, <laughs> but I do know that you, you know, sell it on your own marketplace. Yeah. I, I, so, so, you know, so I think I, I would say it's 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 probably healthy in unique situations where. There is, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of the situations where, you know, you start a company and, and you get a hundred million dollar offer for your company less than 12 months after you start it. It's crazy to not take any money off the table at that point. Sure. But that I think is, it's, it's certainly the exception, not the rule. Okay. And in that case, typically it's uh, with the um, investors who come in the next round that right. that liquidity happens. Um, either the early investors or the new investors will sort of take care of that. It's rarely with a, an organized market. Yep. No, I, I would say I, I think this is a great thing that there are a lot more options for liquidity of, of a company because, as you said before, it was IPO or M&A. With a dry IPO market, it meant the only exit was the M&A. And no matter what, the M&A for a company, if we don't think just about the investors, but we, talk, we think really about the future of a company, it's the end of a company as it was built. It's, it lives a different life, the product continues to uh, grow and, and be sold, yeah. but for the entrepreneurs and the team and the culture, it comes to an end. And I think having several now ways to have liquidity for earlier investors and keep the company going and keep the, the story and the life of the company for many years, I think is a terrific thing. So. Um, IPO market is for a particular type of company. It takes longer to get there. You have to be ready to be exposed in many different ways. Uh, I think the second market is, is great. I think another form of liquidity that we see is uh, investors who come at very high valuation sure. and take a big chunk of the, of the company. We saw that with DST, yeah. and uh, I think that's another option I think is very good for the company. So, so, you know, my own experience, I've made 12 investments in the last two plus years, basically. And six of them have go on, gone on to do follow-on rounds, so $5 million or more. It's interesting, we talk about this a lot in Silicon Valley, we talk about it on panels like this, but none of the six that I saw actually had any entrepreneur liquidity in there at all. Um, Jeff, you've done a ton more deals than that. I mean, what, what's your rate look like? I mean, this is about, this is important, because, you know, I think you know at least two of us, maybe or three of us at least, maybe more. Or I'm not sure about your guys' background, but we were entrepreneurs before we were investors, and liquidity, you know, is a big part of you know is a big part of what you know what matters to an entrepreneur, and waiting the full seven to ten years is not always the the right move. So 40 of my 90 companies have raised a total of 400 million dollars. Um, I think there has been like maybe. 10, 15 percent of, of cases, where, so four to six cases where some of the rounds were early liquidity or the, the investors actually bought some shares from yeah. the founders. Yeah. But what has changed is that it used to be the exception 
Whereas now, we really have an open conversation around it. And I was yeah. actually chatting with Barry early on about how I can structure my rounds. Because yeah. typically, I'm the first investor, and so I structure the company on that, on that basis. How can we sort of make that early liquidity happen very easily in terms of the, uh, the legal setup with some FF shares and stuff like that so that you don't screw up the cap table when you actually want to pull yeah. the trigger on this? OK, uh, so uh, yeah, just uh, to be clear, though, we heard, I mean, that was 90 companies. Mm -hmm. I heard hundreds of millions of dollars being invested, and there were six situations. Yep. So, I but mean, the, but the point is, we, we talk about it much more openly. And so, yeah. if the, uh, the founders now want to take advantage of that, I think it's a very open conversation. Whereas in the past, it used to be like, now you don't do that. Or yeah, this this is not. significant. Everybody should listen to what Jeff's saying right <laughs> here. This is very significant. Uh, because 18 months ago, um, you raised the idea of liquidity to your investors, and they would shut you down. Um, they may not invest in you. Now they, they may just pass I mean, on you. The think so about this: you your, your investors are actually now they're 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 they're, <coughs> they're they care about you. They want to see you get a little money off the table so that you can swing for the fences with them. Because the reality is that the bulk of the venture successful returns come from. IPO is that get done and it's performance after the IPO. But the IPO market's dead. So all the investors are realizing now that they, they, they're going to make a whole lot more, than, more money themselves when they allow you to build your company to be a billion dollar company instead of selling at 50 or 100 million because it's the first bid that comes along. I mean, this is sig sig significant kind of what's happening right now and it's empowering to all of us as entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, just maybe you want to. Yeah. One point two. Um, Philippe's coming from the other side. He's at Bessemer. Yeah, he sometimes maybe brings liquidity to founders. Well, exactly. So if I look at the uh, the eight deals I've done, three of them involve liquidity. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think as as we said, time to liquidity is longer, and yep. it really makes sense for late stage companies. You know, when there is already a nine figure valuation on the table, if the founder say, hey, you know, now I want to go for you know another digit in the valuation, yep. makes sense to take something out of the table. But yep. I think. What's, what I like is this type of approach where the founders want to swing for the fences, take a bit on the side, just yeah. feel like it's a win, you can buy a nice house. But when you're talking about a Series A investment in an internet company, pre-revenue, and the CEO starts saying, well, you know, we'd like to take something off the table, yeah. that's where I say, well, yeah. maybe yeah. we don't see it the same way. Uh, I would enough. add a couple of points. One is, I completely agree with what Barry said, because if you actually are not proactive about offering that early liquidity at the Series B level, then, Whenever something happens around 50, 7,500, then the founder is going to be very, very tempted. I just had one of my companies acquired last week by eBay at 75 million. And, you know, we tried to explain that we'd rather offer some liquidity so that we can keep the company going. But at ultimately, it's the, um, uh, the founder's choice to, um, to sell and would never, ever exercise our rights to, uh, to block a sale. And so we sold Milo to eBay after one year and 10 days, right? And so for us, when we see a company which is promising, like I've, I've just structured a, um, a $9 million Series B in one of my companies, and I insisted that the, um, the early uh, founders who had been at it for four years take um, half a million dollars each of the table. And I said, this is almost a mandatory so requirement for the new investor to accept that. So there was no choice. Yep. Yeah, I think it's very healthy, to be honest. I'm an investor also, but I was an entrepreneur. and. Uh, when I started and built business objects in the early days, it's true, after a while, you want to get something out of it. Um, and I think if you have an intelligent conversation with, with your investor, you can perfectly justify it. I mean, it's, some investors would look at it as, oh, the founder is getting less involved in the business now, is less committed, but it's the exact opposite. Yep. Uh, I think when you are, if you have a life, <laughs> and as an entrepreneur, you still have a life. You usually have a, a wife who is uh, okay. who doesn't see you very much. I call her the chief donor. The chief donor, but uh, certainly she's she's thinking. Well, you're working 15 hours a day, and what for? I mean, is there something coming out of that? Yeah. If at some point you can say, well, this is worth it. There's something coming, and we can. Um, have a more balanced life. I think it's better for everybody. Yep. Obviously, it needs to be done reasonably, but I think, uh, and I'm not sure it's a complete new trend, by the way. I mean, I think these conversations have happened for many, yep. many years, and 15 years ago, yep. we're still doing it. Fair enough. All right, so, so I, a bunch of us have been entrepreneurs and switched over to the investment side. 
you know, one of the interesting things for me is I was, and I had war stories. I mean, my last company I started January 2001, it was a networking software company. And there was not a worse time to start a company. I had a lot of lean years. Um, so I had a ton of war stories. What I wanted to do is, if, if you guys have examples, you know, maybe one or two minute examples, you know, keep it short. But uh, when you go to the investment side and you see those same war stories on the other side, I mean, I'm sure we've got a number of entrepreneurs in the room. Maybe you guys have some, uh, some interesting war stories or, or something interesting to, to, you know, interesting lessons to bestow on the entrepreneurs in the group. I'd say that it's not so much a war story, but it's kind of when you make the transition from being on the, in the driver's seat to being in the investor seat, and you still sort of think about how I can run this company, you have this tendency of leaning over the entrepreneur a bit too much and saying, uh. well, that's what I would do, that's what I would do, I would do this. And the number one role we have is one of giving money, nurturing, supporting, helping, mentoring, but never running the company. So if you're an investor, you feel it's a bit too intrusive because it just comes from the, um, from the entrepreneur side. Understand that it takes a couple of years to adjust. So yeah. for a noob investor, just push back gently saying, I'm the CEO. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, that took me a while to, to fully let go. When I, went from, when I went from the entrepreneur to the investor, I would, I'd get all excited, we'd be talking about stuff, and then they'd go leave and run the company, and I felt like I was being abandoned. It was kind of a funny feeling. Uh, go for it, Philippe. Yeah, so I, I think what I, what I found is, um, you know, it's not easy, it's actually managing the upside. I mean, the downside, everyone knows you need to do something, you know, to, yeah. you know it, it's bad. What's, what's uh, most difficult is to say, well, when things are really firing, you know, how do you manage both? You know, how fast can you grow without putting in danger the company? And just one example here was, you know, a, a few years ago I had a company which was really going super fast and the demand in the market was really explosive. And so at some point they just, you know, keep on hiring and hiring just to try to feel, fulfill the demand, sure. but didn't realize that, you know, at some point you really need to define your strategy, focus on a specific market segment. And that included, even in a super fast growing company, everything, everything was doing super well, doing, you know, let's step back, do a reef, yeah. you know, 15%, 20% of the people, refocus the strategy and tackle the market there. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's actually harder to do it in a good time because then people might not understand than to do it in, in the downtime yeah. where everyone knows it's uh, something you need to do. Yeah, fair enough. I, the, um, you know, one of the war stories that, that I've seen even, you know, I guess this is about a year ago, was entrepreneurs often, it's like, okay, VC, I'm gonna go do my thing. I'll check in with you every month or every few months or something like that. Um, I saw one where an, a, an entrepreneur who felt good about a deal, who felt good about a, a, a big round that was gonna come in from a venture capital firm, decided to go and sign a term sheet with that venture capital firm at terms already negotiated uh, without coordinating with any of his angel investors. Um, so we had about 15 to 20 angel investors who were not happy with the deal, who also had veto rights on the deal. Um, and we had a very interesting situation. Um, I think Bessemer might have been involved in that. Um, all right, go for it. Mm, so, <laughs> this is, so this is my first company. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a recovering investment banker, um, did that for five years, and one of the lessons that I've learned, uh, so we're in a war right now, actually, as a business. Um, so early on, we thought that uh, the Wall Street establishment was gonna be key to our success. So I was very reluctant um, to kind of, to shit on Wall Street. Um, but now I'm happy to say, you know, I think Wall Street's pretty fucked up, quite frankly. And I think that there's a tremendous opportunity to completely disrupt um, that industry. And that's what we're trying to do. So the war that we're in right now, so it's less of a war story, it is a, I guess it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing war, is that, you know, we're taking on uh, NASDAQ, we're taking on the New York Stock Exchange, we're taking on the underwriters, we're trying to convince all of you that um, there's only one way to go and it's an IPO path, when the reality is, is um, you know, the vast majority of us are never gonna go IPO. And see, it's- but that, I don't see the war, right? Like, you're going to entrepreneurs and saying, hey, I'll bring you liquidity, how about that? You're going to angel investors saying, I'll bring you liquidity, how about that? They, I don't see a war there. Yeah, well, well they're, they're, they're certain board members, um, certainly they're lawyers, who make right. a lot of money on an IPO. 
uh, certainly the bankers that I don't know what, I don't know who else here is getting phone calls from those bankers. But you know your phone rings off the hook. They right. want to kind of sit down and talk to you about you know your path you know to exit. Fair enough. But how do those bankers stop you? Can how, they really how, stop you? Can they stop us? Yeah, I mean they no, may not be no, happy no. about it. Well, well look, that's what I, well, look, that's what I learned. I mean, it, it took me a while to, to realize that, um, and I'm sure this is the same for any industry. But the the the, the Wall Street banks, they're so slow to move and they cannot innovate. Wall yeah. Street uh, it can innovate product, can come up with new investments that generally speaking screws investors, yeah. but Wall Street as an industry does not innovate on the process. Wall Street makes so much money yeah. off of opacity, off of keeping yeah. things kind of quiet in the dark. So, so now, five years later, I'm comfortable saying that they can't stop us, but three, four years ago, I would never be saying fair, this type of thing. Fair enough, let me ask a quick question. Have you seen a situation where a founder or an angel was trying to get liquidity on your site and they were stopped by a venture capital firm or by one of their major investors? Two years ago, all the time. Uh, a year ago, sometimes, today, never. Never, even with the right of first refusal and other terms, uh, do they ever stop those deals from going through? Uh, well, I think it's important to point out that second market um, as a business, as a model, um, our customer, our client, really is actually the company themselves. So yeah. what, what we do is we work with the company to essentially establish a market for their stock where the company decides every control around their market. So they decide who the buyers are. They decide when the market's open. Is it, a, is it an auction once a year or is it once a week, whatever yeah. it may be. So in most cases, the company is pre-waiving a rover or in certain cases they're not, but they've approved who the buyers are. Yeah, I've seen a ton of situations where companies actually can also stop those, li those liquidity events for employees, et cetera. But yeah, I guess a lot of times they can make, you know. Well, th well that's, that's, that's what's gonna happen next. We were talking about angel liquidity, we're talking about founder liquidity. The next uh, phase of what we're going through right now is the concept of employee liquidity, and it's putting some value back in those options that we're all giving to our employees who, who can't wait 10 years. And so That's what we're seeing with more frequency are programs that allow or enable employees to get liquidity. Again, it's, it. it's, it's vested options. They have to be at the company for five years and get in, get in a little bit of money. I mean, it's not Fair kind enough. of FU money, but it's enough to kind of let them to, you know, get the mortgage or buy the car. All right, got it. Go for it. I'm just going back to the idea of a horror story and, and partly also to the, uh, to the public market. Uh, I've lived a horror story at Business Objects, but as a public company, and usually horror stories then they, they, they get amplified in terms of uh, the ups and the downs. Um, we had a situation where we had, you know, we had gone public, the company had uh, uh, done extremely well, the market cap was a billion, which at the time was, was really big. Uh, but then we missed a number of things. We missed a product release. We missed um, earnings. Uh, we had a uh, restatement because we had a bad deal in Germany. And the stock, which was at $55, went all the way down to $4. Uh, so that was kind of a horror story <laughs> at that time. And yeah. one where uh, it's, you're not just having a conversation with your board members, but you're having a conversation with about 100 angry investors sure. and analysts on the earnings call and about tens and tens of thousands of investors. What was the lesson that came out of it? The last thing that came out of it? Uh, the, the lesson, the lesson. Oh, the lesson. Right, so you well, go down from 50 to four. <coughs> what well, you get out? What, fortunately, what? If we went from four back up to 300 okay. uh, in the following three years. But I think the key to me in terms of the, uh, the horror story is how, how do you manage to get out of it and turn it around? It depends a lot on the trust that you have with the people who are getting, as a CEO, who are gonna decide if you're the right guy for the future. So in a, uh, in a very difficult situation, the, the, the question is going to be, uh, even if you screwed up, that's not the main issue. The, the main issue is that do you have a vision and can you articulate that vision of how you're gonna get the company out of it? Because any, every company will go through a tough period. Sure. Uh, there's, there's no straight line forever. And the luck I had at that point is at a very supportive board. And I think that's what the board needs to define at yes. some point. Is and this guy gonna take us And that's something for entrepreneurs to remember is that VCs are not just money, they're also on your board. Uh, the way I often look at that is I'm, you know, I look at it as hiring an employee. Um, now when, now, when you, when you bring that person on, it, I mean, you just got to be able to see the eye to eye. Now, a lot of times entrepreneurs do not have the, uh, the opportunity to pick 
who their investor is, but, but uh, in these kinds of times, that's happening a hell of a lot more often. Okay, so I want to actually go on a little bit more of a controversial uh, topic. Um, something I've seen in a couple companies I'm involved in, and it, it's a tricky situation. Uh, this is one in which, which I've seen uh, entrepreneurs actually, entrepreneurs and founder CEOs either move to the side, maybe as a chief product officer or something like this, or sort of taken out of the company altogether. Um, again, I, I really identify at the entrepreneurial side, even as an investor. I, that's just in my blood. Um, and it's been, it's been really interesting to see that and, you know, not, not always comfortable. Um, I'm wondering what you guys think on the topic. Well, I think <clears throat> there's really two scenarios. One is the, the company is doing really, really well. And at some point, you think that you want to scale up the, the management skills and the experience, the expertise, and so on and so forth. And so you have a really sort of conversation way before with the team about how to best scale the company. Yep. And done that many times over. And typically, if you choose the right person to come in the company, and it's a process which can take some time, you know, nine, year, uh, nine, nine yeah. months or 12 months or whatever, then it's very smooth and cash share work. The bad scenario is, you know, the company is just not working and the founding CEO needs to be replaced because it's just not able to get there. And that typically can be, um, can be tricky. Yeah, what's your, what's your take on percentage of situations where you bring in a new CEO? Could be even an amicable situation and it works out. If you do a good job, it's not rushed, it's 70%. Ooh, that's not bad. Well, it means that 30% of the time you screw up. That's, that is bad. All right, Philippe, what do you got? I mean, it's interesting because we have seen, uh, I mean, first of all, we invest behind entrepreneurs and behind teams. So that's obviously kind yeah. of the extreme case. But um, some of the time when you invest and you back a very young team, you know, the, C, the, uh, the CEO at the time, entrepreneur, saying, well, you know, I know at some point I'll have to step aside, do something else which I like on product, and then bring someone professional. And usually that, that happens, uh, you know, kind of in conjunction with, uh, with the boards and the founders very involved in, uh, in the section of the CEO. I think we have one interesting case where this happened. We brought in uh, the CEO. After six months, we realized, you know, this was not working. So we had to replace the CEO, and what we did is actually the founder we brought back. back to CEO, yep. but we, we added a part-time chairman, which was oh, someone very senior yep. who actually coached the CEO, and now you know the company is uh, you know north of 100 million of revenues, and uh, it has worked very well. So any kind of scenario is, is possible here. All right. Well, very good. Well, I'm gonna we're running out of time, so I'm gonna just do one last question uh, for for all of us. I guess we're all investors, and then you help investors, and you see a, a ton of uh, companies. Uh, selling or individuals selling selling stock. What is the company that you've invested in that has not seen a liquidity event that you think you're going to make the most money on? Blickoff. Okay. So I have one company that filed already to go public, so I'll leave oh, okay. that aside. Mm -hmm. But that the next the side, one yeah. is uh, I think uh, Criteo, which is actually a friend company. We uh, help them expand to the U.S. and they're in the personalized retargeting space. All right. Very good. Uh, as a marketplace, I don't think what's, it's, it's what's fair. The hottest, what's the hottest company on your index right now? Um, well, the one that uh, has the most activity is Facebook. Um, the one that has the most buyer interest prior to even the news last week was, was Groupon. Um, and, I mean, the volumes on second market right. are, you know, we'll probably do $400 million this year or 100 last. So it's, right, everything's keep, going pretty fast. Let's keep rolling. Let's keep rolling. We got a couple in there. Well, at, at Balderton, I think the, uh, the best company we have uh, right now is a company called Wonga, and, uh, which... Uh, provide short-term loans uh, currently in the UK market. Yep. To me, this is the business in Europe that has the most amazing business model and uh, by far the fastest growth. It's a very exciting business. Yeah, fair enough. All right, guys, thanks for coming. I apologize for being a little late. The uh, subway system got me a little lost. No worries. But uh, good to see you. Okay. And thank you.